so sorry about that. So, somehow it's hard to get my uh, computer to recognize the um, the the exact thing that the monitors um, um, what the projector is doing. So we'll we'll do it in this way. At least you get to see the whole slide this way. Um, so. This talk, I wanted to talk about supernova progenitors for these core collapse um, objects. Um, I will tell you that, um, so you heard from um, Fritz, you know, he found out two weeks ago he really has to get his slides done. When I found out two weeks ago that I had to get my slides done, I was in um, La Reunion Island for a meeting on Supernova 1987A, 30 years after, and it turned out that Raphael Hershey and Alex Hager we're both at the meeting, um, and they both do a lot of stellar modeling. Raphael Hershey was um, trained here in Switzerland, um, uh, working with Mene and Medair, and now is in the UK, um, uh, uh, still doing stellar evolution. Um, so I actually lifted some slides from their talks at this meeting to produce my lecture here. Um, and I wanted to focus on um, I'm going to give you a basic idea of stellar evolution, but I, I assume you guys know at least most of the basics of stellar evolution. I want to talk about two of the main issues in uh, massive star uh, modeling to produce progenitors of uh, core collapse explosions, and that is how you do your mixing in stars and how you do your mass loss. And then I will end with a discussion of binary effects um, because there is a lot of um, evidence that massive stars are in binaries and hence a lot of the single star models that we have could be misleading on what the physics is. Um, so let's start with a picture that Stan Woolsey made of the evolution of supernova 1987A. Remember this is the supernova that kind of um, proved to us that there was a core collapse supernova because we saw the neutrinos so we needed it to collapse down to a compact core to emit a lot of neutrinos. Um, it had one weird feature in that when it actually collapsed it was a blue supergiant. Um, uh, Stan Woolsey played around with parameters um, to get the um, uh, conditions to reproduce supernova 1987A, even with a single star, although, I, although I, would, I would argue that most people now think supernova 1987A was in a binary, so not all of this is exactly correct. Um, but here's the star. It started off um, born, born about 8 million BC, um, evolved, um, and Stan actually has some nice little things where he says that's when the eight men emerged. Um, um, and then he has core hydrogen exha exhaustion at 700 B 700,000 BC when we have Homo erectus. It then evolves through, this is the main sequence, so this is that hydrogen burning main sequence where stars spend 90% of their life. Then it evolves through nitrogen burning um, and um, so it has nitrogen burning, it, it goes in, goes through some Cepheid uh, pulsations, then helium burning in the red supergiant phase, that's at 650,000 BC, um, and we now have fire and tool making on, on the Earth. Um, then, in his model, he's losing some mass here, about one to two solar masses in a slow, dense wind. Um, that's what he's going to use to help explain some of the um, features of 1987A. Um, at about 45,000 BC, um, we have core helium exhaustion and Homo sapiens. Um, carbon ignition at 10,000 BC, that's when we start getting um, agriculture. And now we're losing a lot of energy through neutrinos in that burning phase. Um, and then he gets to the um, evolution of the star. The final years, 1971, it was doing neon ignition. 1983, it was doing oxygen ignition. 1987, February 13th, it was doing silicon ignition. And then it died February 23rd, so 10 days later, um, it, it uh, uh, actually died. Now, of course, none of those times are right because it was far away, so it took some time for the light to get here. But um, um, that's, that's the rough picture of what a star's life is. Um, going through these phases, 
This is another way of seeing those phases where you have the fuel in the center, it's hydrogen, it produces helium, that then becomes a fuel of the next phase, producing oxygen and carbon, you then have carbon burning, producing neon and magnesium, then neon burning, producing oxygen and, and magnesium. Eventually you make up a, a oxygen shell, that oxygen burns to make silicon and sulfur, the silicon then burns to make iron. So it's going through these successive phases. Um, they often call it the onion skin layer of a, of a star as you do this burning. Um, and I just wanted to, okay, we've talked about some, I was thinking this was gonna be a day later, and I was gonna remind you, remember this diagram. This is, you know, this is the useful diagram. We just walked through the star's life. This diagram has all of it in it. Here I have the burning, the hydrogen burning, that's that initial phase, um, the helium burning, I can, if I look at this, I can say, oh yeah, here's where the neutrinos are. This, this um, kind of purple color is all the energy lost through neutrinos. So that's when neutrinos start playing a role in the burning. In fact, why the burning phases are so quick at the end here is they're generating a lot of energy, but they're losing it all through neutrinos. Um, the phase in hydrogen burning can be fairly slow. There's no other loss of the energy than photons, so the, the uh, star keeps hot. It, um, doesn't doesn't feel the pressure of the rest of the star on it. It just those photons slowly leak out. But once you get to a point where you have burning going on, but it's so hot that it's emitting neutrinos. You're you're burning. You're producing all this energy, but I'm losing it all through neutrino emission. So the star keeps on being compact, and it keeps being hot. It burns at a, a higher rate. So it does all these successive burning phases at a fairly high rate. Um, and like we saw, the silicon burning happened 10 days before the end. And, um, and in fact, in this case, yeah, that's about right. Um, silicon ignition for this particular star, this 22 solar mass star, a little bit bigger than Stan's 87A model, is 100th of a year. So that puts it at um, you know, about three or four days before um, the, uh, the death of this star. So silicon burning happens fairly quickly. Um, this, is, um, this is a diagram made by Alex Hager. He makes some, one of the, I think, most informative versions of the Kippenhahn diagram. But you can see almost anything you want in, this, um, in that phase of the star from this. So I just keep on showing it up um, um, in, in, the, in the chance. So I hated this diagram for at least um, two years that I spent with Stan Woosley um, working with him, and somehow I've, I've now embraced it as being very informative. So you want to see this many times in your life until you um, then love it, but I think you can't love it on first or second glance for sure. Um, so the star makes this uh, um, uh, onion skin layer, and I want to talk about that a little bit more, but I realize since uh, Alicia hasn't given you a talk on some of the supernova types for um, core collapse, I, um, I wanted to at least remind you um, of the different types of supernova. So the, the 1A supernova are the thermonuclear supernova. Um, they are described because they have, they, they are kind of, the, the feature of them is in the spectra, they see um, strong silicon absorption lines. There are two uh, other type 1 supernova. They're categorized as type 1 because they have no hydrogen. There's the 1B supernova. They have no silicon in their um, um, spectra, but they do have helium. The type 1c have no helium in their spectra. Um, and then the type 2 all have hydrogen. And there's a whole bunch of different categories of type 2 supernova, um, type 2 narrow lines, type 2 uh, um, linear, um, type 2p, their plateau, so type 2n, type 2l, type 2p. Alicia will eventually be here. She'll describe those in detail. Um, as far as I care as a theorist is, that means for progenitors, type 2 supernova, the, the 1b, 1c, and type 2s are all core collapse. For the, for the progenitors, the type 2 still have to have hydrogen in their spectra. The type 1b still have helium, sorry, type 2 still have hydrogen on, their, on the star, so there has to be a hydrogen layer on top. Type 1b, they have helium on top, so there's a helium layer. And type 1c, I gotta remove even the helium from the star. Um, and so that's some of the tricks for looking at us, uh, understanding um, core collapse supernova. Um, the way to see this in a star, here's a plot, and I'm gonna show several of these at some point, so um, uh, we'll make sure that we understand them in detail. This is the enclosed mass of the star. This is the abundance fraction in log space. So this is 0.1 abundance, 0.01, and this is roughly a thousandth of a, a, 
of the mass in this coordinate space is um, whatever element it is. So I've colored different elements. Black is hydrogen. So if you look at the edge of a star, a normal 20, this is a 20 solar mass star with not much mass loss because I, I picked a one that was 10 to the minus four solar metallicity. It didn't have much mass loss. So it's pretty much almost all hydrogen with a layer of helium. These are the primordial abundances of the, the star bef when it was born. So you just have the initial abundances of the hydrogen and helium when it was born. Um, this is a 20 solar mass star from Alex Hager and Stan Woosley. Um, at, there's some transition layer where you have an a helium shell versus this kind of mixed helium and hydrogen um, layer. This depends a lot on how you do your mixing. And we'll see how this changes as we talk about mixing. Then there's that carbon oxygen shell. So here's the uh, carbon and oxygen. Here's the silicon shell. And here's that iron shell. So these are the kind of shells of the star. You know, you, the abundance is dominated by one element or another as you're going through, out through the um, um, enclosed mass of the star. So this is the outer layer. This star, if it blew up, it would be a type two um, because it still has all that hydrogen. And in fact, we can take those stars and look at them and decide what kinds of supernova do they produce. Um, so if we, we looked at, uh, Alex Hager did this, he looked at single star fates took what we knew about explosions, and then said, here's the fate of a star. This is the fate as he goes up in mass. This is as he goes, this is solar metallicity. This is as he's going toward no metals in the star. Um, it's roughly log logarithmic scale in this. So you start off with something that has a lot of hydrogen on top of it, if it's a low mass star. Um, as I start to lose star through winds, which as I go to more massive stars, I get more winds, I get something that is on that boundary where I've lost most of the hydrogen, and we, at, at least at that time, thought that type 2 linear and type 2, there's a class called type 2b supernova. Um, that was that transition phase for those, those supernova. And then you made 1b, and then as you got more mass loss, you got 1c. If you went um, up in metals, it got easier and easier to remove that mass through winds, so you, it made it easier to make um, more 1b, 1c's at a lower mass coordinate. Um, as you go up in mass, if you don't lose a lot of the mass through winds, you end up getting the fate w that we were discussing um, um, on our f in the first talk, where the star doesn't explode and it makes a black hole. So all of these are black holes. They don't form any kind of supernova. Um, I, I don't have actually that much on um, the one class of supernova um, called pulsational pair supernova. I'll talk about it in the next slide. But there's a category where you can get an instability and actually destroy the entire star. The star, it, it, it well, well, I'll talk about it in the next slide. But that's one way to destroy the, um, the, the star and still make an explosion. It doesn't form a black hole at all. It just makes a large explosion. And we, at the time, we had thought that this only happened at low metallicity. Um, um, but I think there's cases where you can even make it at higher metallicity um, and make these uh, pair instability supernova. This is a plot by Alex Hager where he was studying um, the fates of massive stars. And he had a nice way of actually showing how you could, you know, by just the density and temperature conditions, show how the fates of stars can vary. And what he had done was he looked at the... Um, the, it's, it's essentially, you could do this with entropy. If I were a, a complete Hans Beta fanatic, entropy would be everything for me. Um, you can look at the uh, entropy of these different stars as they evolve in the core and ask the question, what kind of temperature density conditions the, do they get? And the very massive stars, the ones above about 200 solar masses, uh, actually about above 150, 130 solar masses, get to a region where the core is in this case where the photons are producing pairs. So it's so hot, the photons can produce electron-positron pairs. They produce those pairs. The pressure from electron-positron pairs is lower than the pressure from the photons, so the pressure that it exerts. So you actually lose some pressure. The star compresses, and it keeps on compressing. You, you produce more pairs. It keeps on pr pr uh, compressing, getting hotter and hotter until you get the, um, the burning is so violent that you get the star to actually explode. And this can happen in um, just a pulse that explodes. 
expands the star out, lets it re reset, or it can actually have the entire core burn into 60 solar masses of nickel and make a huge explosion. Um, and in that case, it's, it's like a type 1a supernova. The, the material burns, you burn the core, which is usually carbon oxygen in this phase, <coughs> um, into um, nickel 56. It generates so much energy, it disrupts the entire star. You get, in, um, you get a very bright explosion. Um, we have a couple observed examples where we think their parent stable supernova, um, and that's the fate. At lower masses, you actually you avoid that pair instability phase, so you just keep on burning in a more steady state until you build up that iron core, and then you get the fate that we talked about in the first lecture. Um, and then there's a period where, as you get to too low mass, you um, get a place where the um, there's non-relativistic electrons getting degenerate, and then you get to a condition where you make white dwarfs. There is some boundary layer where you can make a, even though you're making something that's a degenerate um, uh, core that looks like a white dwarf, it's too massive to um, prevent uh, collapsing inward. And this is, is the electron capture supernova, where you get electron capture stell and make a supernova, but you don't have an iron core um, at the end of its life. So these are the kind of different fates that you can see in a physics uh, point of view. I just thought this was another um, nice, nice additional way to see that physics. Um, the caveat with Korkolov supernova is, um, and Fritz hasn't told you the sad story about type 1a supernova, which is they don't know what their progenitor is, but we actually don't trust the people modeling the progenitors for core collapse supernova. And let me show you one of the reasons why I don't. This is a plot of entropy of a, the inner regions of a star. Um, it's, they're all 25 solar mass star models. Um, I have two, two models from Alex Hager, one at solar metal, metallicity, one at zero metallicity. And that's the blue and the um, cyan colors. So they look kind of similar. The core, actually, in these massive stars doesn't change that much by metallicity. Now, now the outside will change because there's a different mass loss on the winds, but the core doesn't change that much. So I could say, oh, yeah, OK, I have my progenitors. The core doesn't change that much. The green curve is a, um, a model by Limonghi and Jeffy. 25 solar mass star should be the same, zero metallicity. Here's their entropy. So they're getting a very different entropy profile. And unfortunately for us, well, the good news is for core collapse, we really care about this entropy. So we only care about this shift in the entropy. But there's a shift in the entropy in the stars just by the different um, stellar models. And we're still in the case where we've done comparisons with the codes that are out there. There's a set of codes. Um, there's the, the code um, Raphael Hershey uses that Medea and Mene, that we call it the Swiss stellar evolution code, um, or the Geneva code, GenEC. The, the, uh, there's a code in Italy with Lamonghi and Chieffi. There's Alex Hager, the code that Alex Hager and Stan Woolsey use. There's a code, um, it's Kepler. There's a code called Tycho, um, done by Dave Arnett. Um, I'm, I'm going to miss some of them. And there's one called Mesa, um, which is a publicly available code, um, but it is the least tested of the codes. So it, it's out there, available. You can grab it. Um, when we did a comparison between all of these codes, um, I, I talked about discrepancies here. The Mesa code had even further discrepancies. It was by far very different, uh, more different than in almost any other code in modeling the stars. So the different codes and what they do produce very different results. If you just grab one stellar evolution code and get a result, you've produced, you know, it, you haven't told me what a 25 solar mass star looks like. You've produced what a 25 solar mass star by that code looks like. So there's a lot of um, uh, differences in these codes. The argument of what's causing the differences is either how they do mixing or mixing plus rotation, or how they do mass loss. So there's, this is the, the, are the big arguments of why are our codes different. Um, and let me just show you the problem with uh, 